This video is brought to you by my wonderful Patreon team. If you want to join the Patreon, please feel free to click the link down below. And if not, that's totally fine. I hope you enjoyed this video. What stories can be told within the games that we play? I'm not talking about an overarching main plot, but I mean within the gameplay that allows us as a player to create our own micro narratives within the game's mechanics and even combat. YouTuber Post Mesmeric made an incredible video looking into the soundtrack of Hotline Miami. He points out how the game forces you to take a slow walk back through the levels and have a good look at the destruction and even death that you've caused. And I will leave a link of course to this incredible video and of course his channel down below, but it got me thinking about what stories are told through the aftermaths and even the blood-stained aftermaths that we cause ourselves within gaming. Blood has been spilled across the floor, repainting rooms with a new lick of crimson. Brains hang from skulls and corpses pile on top of each other with a still and even clumsy nature. What happened within these walls within the last 10 minutes? I guess we're about to find out. Hotline Miami is a vaporwave, hyper-violent experience. It's not afraid to remind you that it's not always about making the most explosive exit, but instead looking at the choices and the moments that caused you to act so violently. But before we go back to the ultra-violent 80s of Hotline Miami, let's first go back to 2000, or at least the early 2000s. I was seriously obsessed with ragdoll physics within gaming. It's what really made me fall in love with the technical sides of creating a game and the engineering work behind game development itself. I used to play games like The Punisher from 2004 and I was just so excited to see how the bodies will sprawl out across the floor in organic ways. No longer were the days of animated deaths, though it still has its merits and it still has a place in gaming, I was seriously in love with just how gaming allowed us to create our own narratives just by the way that bodies uniquely and even interestingly sprawl across the floor to show our own micro narratives and experiences within combat. It was almost like making a diorama of destruction and death that you left behind because of your actions. For me growing up it was super interesting to see, especially as it was almost like I was directing my own movie and it was seeing these stuntmen laid out in ways that I expected them to because of my choices. Damn it, Castle! For me, this interest really grew when it came to Halo 2. Bungie had really outdone themselves and especially the ragdoll physics at the time and it really blew my young mind. In the first Halo games, the bodies were all pre-animated when they were killed. They didn't have ragdoll physics, but instead opt for a simple and basic use of inverse kinematics. If you're wondering what inverse kinematics is, it's when your character props their leg up on an uneven set of terrain that we've seen used throughout gaming for the last decade or even more. But of course in Halo 1's case it's not just exclusive to popping legs up on dynamic terrain, but instead it's made to help the bodies look like they're dynamically leaning or even hanging over certain edges. But it gives off a weird melty effect and even sometimes creates something a little bit more mutated. In Halo 2 though, when I would kill an enemy I would walk back through areas of the map and just see them laying where I left them and as I killed them. Walking back through areas and seeing grunts sprawled out across the floor, jackals leaning over balconies and of course elites sitting up against the walls with gun wounds going through their heads, it's this idea which really got me thinking in the first place and what steps did I get to lead for their bodies to really be there. And I've had this fascination ever since then, looking at how bodies and what stories can be told within corpses or even what's left behind a destructive battle. Was it me being able to take the right shot at the right time or getting in close combat with elites or even find the right grenade? There's a lot of destruction and there's scars left behind within the world of Halo to show you a story and a visual narrative of the combat you just engaged with and from that moment I was just in love with the stories that we can make ourselves within gaming because of the dynamic poses that Rag those can really offer us. Break's over, Rush. Let's go. But of course it's fair to say there's a lot of modern shooters which are fast paced, games like Call of Duty or even your Medal of Honours, focusing on pushing forward. And in most cases you really have no reason to take a moment and think about all the people you've killed and look at all the destruction you've caused, because at the end of the day in games like Call of Duty, they're baddies and you are the badass military man so it's go go go. 
To Call of Duty's credit though, they do have some moments which really do show you the effects of war and even terrorism within this world. As you walk through an airport, you must watch innocent people get murdered by the millions as a result of you pulling the trigger and even your actions. Or in games like Spec Ops The Line, you burn people to death and see them screaming for mercy because of Captain Walker's personality of shoot first and think later approach the war. But these are honestly all just plot related moments and the story has to have these moments because it's written within the game. But I want to talk about Battlefield Bad Company. Bad Company introduced the series to environmental destruction and possibly changed the game for environmental destruction within gaming that we're seeing today. You was forced to think on your toes to create your own sense of cover. The world would collapse and even crumble around you with each gunfight. You was truly able to destroy the world around you for your own advantage. Where in most traditional shooters, you were told to get to an advantage point created by the developers, but in Bad Company, it was for you to create that advantage point yourself. During combat, enemies will be hiding inside houses, so I made sure I blew a hole in its side and made a grand entrance. To get a good shot on a turret, I had to go into a barn, so I decided to climb into the attic and blow a hole into the ceiling and make my own little hole to get an advantage point to actually blow up that turret itself. And because enemies were taking cover within the garage, I decided to blow its walls down with an infamous red barrel. And after all the dust has settled, there's no immediate cut to black. There's no cutscene, there's no real tension breaker. But instead, you're taking a moment to regain yourself, get ammo and take a look around at all the destruction you've caused. As you see bodies sprawled out across the floor and bullet holes and even walls destroyed, you really understand the narrative of this combat and you knew what you needed to do and why these holes are there in the first place. Because you decided to make a side entrance, because you needed to blow a hole in that roof to destroy the gunman on the turret, and because they were taking cover inside the garage, you decided to blow it all to smithereens. There's dust, smoke, bodies, blood left behind because of your choices within combat and this was just only one combat segment within Battlefield Bad Company and I really do love the visual stories left behind because of the destruction that you're able to cause and it can really send chills down your spine. To be the cool over the top marine and sending down a cascade of rockets onto enemies within buildings and then being told to take a slow walk through that village filled with nothing more than rubble, corpses, turned over furniture and a village that was clearly once lived in by so many people, it reminds you that there was once life here and now it's destroyed for the sake of it being a battlefield. The stealth genre actively makes you aware of your choices and how you handle and even interact with bodies and enemies within the gameplay. Games like Dishonored, where you have the choice to sneak past enemies without a single death or going full aggression and set all the alarms off or even not kill anyone at all and sneak past without anyone even knowing you was there. Within stealth, we're able to put ourselves in our own situations because of the actions that we chose. And that's where the challenge truly comes in with the genre. We all dream to sneak around and handle enemies and hide their bodies without being seen, but the developers make sure we're asked to put in the work and pay attention to the little details within the world and the environments. Placing bodies correctly or even hiding equipment within a stealth game can become your greatest ally, making sure you hide pistols within bins or even sneak past enemies and hide their bodies within bushes. This can really help you and it can help the outcome of the mission and most stealth games truly rely on where and how you place certain items within its world. But what happens when the items in the world are placed there by other players? To a message put down to warn you of death, to a nicely placed ladder, rope or even a vehicle in Death Stranding. There truly is a struggle and even a narrative behind every single piece of equipment that's left behind within Death Stranding's world. Most of them are there just to provide Sam with some sort of help while he makes his deliveries. But what is the story of why this one ladder was placed here? We're able to see players names above these items in the world, but why did Zayko Tank put this ladder here for me in the first place? Was it a shortcut or was it just a moment to moment short action to get across as quick as possible? And what's the reason of this red van being deserted by its owner? I love these little interactions that you're able to have with other players despite there truly being no contact at all. 
No need to explain or even show us the reason why, but it's left for us to wonder and even ponder what could have actually happened within their own narratives. And because you decided to choose and even use their items, that narrative now becomes yours and whoever uses the ladder after you now becomes a part of their story as well. There's a simple narrative left behind as something as simple as a ladder or a rope and I think it's genius and brilliant way to show that we can interact and even create our own micro stories within gameplay. These items are truly a narrative of unity between players. And as much as I love to see stories of success or even bodies placed out like an old school western shootout, I also love to see it when games remind you of your failures. Super Meat Boy actively shows you the meat blood spread across the world as a reminder that you suck and you died this many times in just one stage. Or even sometimes it's not your own failures that are left behind, with games like Carry On which have you play of some sort of Lovecraftian creature and the blood left behind is from you slivering and even killing so many people. But it's that destruction left behind that spread across the walls which tells you that something happened here and it was probably something really bad. And that's what brings me back to Hotline Miami. You will die a lot within Hotline Miami and you'll experience trial and error unlike any other game. And due to its fast respawn time, dying and even coming back to life almost seems like nothing at all. Each attempt will blend together and start feeling like a mix of blur and blood and guts. With each room you must learn new ways to handle the situation that you're really forcing yourself into. Use a door to push an enemy to a ground, take the advantage of windows to shoot through and of course learn the placement of items within the world to grab them efficiently. Each attempt, each swing, each pull of a trigger will come together as a cascade of death and destruction but as you make your way out with blood dripping from your fists you will remember each and every moment that you remained within this stage. Zombies spread out across the floor and liquors claws left between walls in the Raccoon City Police Department of Resident Evil 2. Furniture falling apart and lights swinging within control and of course a lonely ladder sitting in a wasteland waiting to be used by its next delivery person. These are all small narratives that we as players are able to create ourselves because of our choices and what we chose to leave behind and what narratives we created for ourselves within these moments of gameplay. Hello everybody, thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video and please let me know some stories and even if you have the similar sort of interest as I do when it comes to aftermath of gameplay mechanics and of course bodies rolled out across the floor of destruction of maps. I've always found it quite interesting and I hope I didn't sound too psychopathic explaining it. And if you enjoyed this video please leave a like down below and of course subscribe for more videos like this every single week and I will see you at the next checkpoints, goodbye.